If you would, let's pray. Not, let's, let's bring this message together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the guys that are here, the guys that are on the Zoom meeting. We love you. We thank you, Father, first and foremost, that you love us more than our sin, that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. And Jesus, you came as the Lamb of God. You who knew no sin became our sin and went to the cross to pay the price. And then you rose from the dead and you walked out of that grave on the third day, defeating the power of sin and death in our lives and making us born again, children of the living God. Our name is written in the book of life for eternity. And we pray today that your word would touch us in a powerful way so that we can be light and salt in this world, this, this dark and, and foreboding world. We pray that you'd bless us to shine for you, Jesus, we pray. For it is Christ in us, Christ in you, Christ in me, the hope of glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you, you many of you know, um, that the difference between a Christian who truly knows Christ, who truly understands their salvation, and they begin to understand what the Word of God says, that they have hope. They have hope no matter what, because they realize that their life and their place is not here, that this is a temporary life. Now, when you're younger, it's a little hard to think that way. You get a little older, it's a little easier. If you got some problems physically, it's easier to think like that. But if you don't, you're all healthy and strong and young. You don't really think like that. And that's why I always say to people, just to sober them down a little bit and let them think for a minute, everything's about Jesus Christ, number one. And the second statement is, where are you going to be in 10,000 years? Because no matter how strong you are and how happy you are with your life and no matter how young you are, 10,000 years sort of puts it out of the range of you sort of, you know, work out, stay in shape, you're going to get there. You're not going to get there. The point is that where are you going to be in 10,000 years is a big deal. So how are you going to live your life now? Now, I'll be very candid with you. When I was born, I was probably born, I think, and, and I lived through this time in the, in the absolute perfect part of history to experience unbelievable things financial you know living in a country that it just dominates you know the health and the strength and the, all the medicine and all the treatments that were available and all these things going forward in the communications just everything is unbelievable unbelievable what a wonderful time and time in history this time has been for me my 74 years have been right dead center in the best time in the history of mankind and no, arguably no problem this is it really where it's at. And so what ends up happening, though, is that everything that goes up, what? It must come down. Now, what we have is that we have a country that was going along based on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and, and, the, and, the, and the letters and the information from our founders and our history. Now, I used to be a high school history teacher. I was hired as a football coach, but I had to do so, something meaningful. So I taught U.S history and world history. And I also taught psychology. Those were my minors, okay, in health and safety. And then I had a, a lifetime teacher's credential uh, secondary. And I had, and so I was there all dialed in thinking, okay, I'm going to be a football coach. I'm going to teach these kids. I'm going to have a great time. I didn't minor detail as I didn't realize that I'd be destitute, never buy a house, never living. Back then, they, they, they paid me 12000 a year and told me if I stuck around for 20 years and got my master's degree, I could make $24,000 a year. And my wife was already working in, in L.A. As, a, as an executive secretary for Chase Manhattan International, making 25. And we couldn't buy a house. We couldn't do anything. And one day it dawned on me, duh, you know, I've got to do something else to make a living. So I went into real estate, and that's history, and we won't talk about that today. But it's been a blessing. But the point is, I had this great, I could just do anything. I, I could just decide, all this education, I've got a job, I've got tenure. So you can't leave. You've got tenure. you just got tenure. Bye, I'm leaving. I, I'm going to coach the kids in football, but as of January, you don't need me, and I'm out of here. And so I got through the football season. Everything was cool, and I moved out, and I came down here. That was in 1974, okay, and I was 26 years old. I told my wife, I said, honey, because we had nobody in Newport Beach. We just said, honey, I'm going into real estate, and it's the United States of America. And I just thought I could just do anything, right? And I said, where do you want to live? Well, we're not going to go to Baldwin Park, and I'm not going back to Lancaster. And I, in L.A., and, and we were in San Gabriel Valley, and this smog and all the stuff down there, we're not going to stay here. Where do you want to go? 
Well, when I was 18, I went to Newport Beach one time and it was really nice. Why don't we go to Newport Beach? I can sell anything. It doesn't matter. Here we are, we got nothing, but what do we got? What do we have? What do we have, David? We had hope. We had hope. We had hope and we knew the Lord and we were following Christ and we were seeking God. And we had faith in God for our salvation and we had hope for our life, right? It, it, that's how it works, right? That's how it goes. We had hope and we got here. We, we were driving around. We didn't know where to go to church. We didn't know what. So we were driving uh, down on Coast Highway on the corner of MacArthur and Coast Highway. It used to be undeveloped forever. It was undeveloped. There was this little tiny place. It was a uh, bank at Newport at once, a uh, bay, a uh, bank at Newport, tiny little building. And um, there was, you know, we were driving along and there was a restaurant on the other side of the street where that hamburger place is now. And it was, uh, Coco's was there, okay. And we'd go there to Coco's really early in the morning. We didn't know where to go. We didn't know what to do. And we got down here and um, doggone it. If we looked across the street and there was a sign that says 7 a.m. or 7.30 a.m. Church service, Mariners, Mariners Church. They had early service. And we were young. I mean, we didn't want to go to church at 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock or 9.30, but 7 o'clock in the morning, man, that's cool. That's good for us because we got a life to live, right? And, and we got a lot of things to do on Sunday, and, but we really want to do things right. We want to seek God first. So what did we do? Man, we went right over there at 7 a.m. in the morning. We got in there, and we started going to Mariners in 1974. I remember they do these things at Mariners where they tell the history of the church and all that. <laughs> they got it. half of it. I'm, where were they? I mean, were they actually there? This is before Kenton, and, and this is what, you know, on and on and on. But the point is this. We hooked up with the Christians. And we were excited, and I started going to Bible studies. I met Bill Acton, and you know, maybe he's gone to the Lord, but I met these people, and, and I just started doing what God had me to do. What? I scrambled, man, and I hit it. I hit it out of the park. I started my first day, I remember, in, in the office, and I, I sat there in my office, and I didn't know how to get from Fashion Island to the ocean. That's the truth. So I had a map on my visor of my old Chevy, and I'd drop it down like this and show me, and so I would start taking people out. I started residential to take them out to show them properties. Now, this is true. The first week I started work, I sold a house. This is a gigantic amount of money back then for $127,000. I mean, in Turtle Rock, the average house sold for like 60 grand, okay? In Big Canyon, you could buy all those houses for $79,000, $85,000, all those, the, the uh, what do you call it, properties and I mean, the condos, you know, we could have bought those, you know, and the point is that all that, I used to sell all that stuff and, and the waterfronts I sold right on Ocean Boulevard, I remember, and the deals just coming. I started, I became a, a rocket, a rocket, just took off. I won all the awards. I became the number one broker in the area, did all these things. And then I was 32, uh, within a moment, I go from being 26 years old to 32 years old. I got a couple of little kids and my wife looks at me and she says, now, but remember, this is before faxes before cell phones, we didn't even have uh, leave a message thing yet, okay? Now picture this. And she says to me, you have to retire. I said, what do you mean retire? I'm at the top. I'm at the top, man. They wrote a book about, I'm in this book of the best brokers in the nation. Why would I quit? What do you mean I have to retire? She says, we can't live like this. You're working six and a half days a week. You do take off a half a day on Sundays to go to church. But other than that, because I was a golfer too, by the way. So I, I, between my golf and working, it was like no time, nothing. And we never went anywhere, didn't do anything. Mike was there, he remembers. That was before Mike came down here. But my brother, anyway, long story short, I won't get into that. We'll do that another day. So I had hope, I had hope. So what did I do? I went over to this guy who ran the uh, commercial division of, of CB and I said, I'm going to work for you. He said, what do you mean you're going? I haven't offered you a job. I, I'm coming next week. He huffed and puffed and I came next week. And I started out. I started out as a senior guy as a thing and I took off there. Boom, God bless me. Why? I had opportunity. There, there, you know, we had downturns, we had high interest rates, but we didn't have what we had today. We didn't have what we had today. We had problems, we made mistakes but we don't have what we have today. There was no woke back then. There was one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 
with inalienable rights granted to us by a creator God in heaven, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we had free speech. We had a media that actually reported all the back and forth, you can, all these things. They had conversations. All these things happened. And sometimes it went liberal and sometimes it, uh, not conservative and went back and forth. My uncle used to tell me, don't worry. If it goes one way too far, it'll come back the other way. And where are we today? If you believe in the word of God as exactly the way it's written, that's hate speech. We're on the way that anybody that doesn't agree with exactly what the word is from the leaders today is going to become what? A domestic terrorist. We're to the point now where we're turning the FBI, the CIA, and the other guys, and the military back towards our own population. We're at the point now where we misunderstand what's going on and we don't realize that what we're doing is, and we have open borders, and what we're doing is we're destroying, if you talk to any, and then I don't want to talk about the masks because I know how politically charged that is, but these children having to wear masks and not going to school and not learning how to interact with each other, not looking at each other's face, not having the normal experiences and athletics and all the opportunities. You talk, and we have a gigantic raise in what? In what suicides by the teenagers and young people. We're losing hope, guys. Our country is flushing hope down the drain. So what do we do? We're Christians. What do we do? How do we respond? In other words, so we've been talking about the difference between yoke, yoking with Christ, and woke, which is basically woking and it's coming together with the evil one and what they call, I call spiritual darkness, the logic of spiritual darkness. That means you take God out of the equation, no Bible, no vertical truth, and you got everything left over. What do you do? How do you figure it out? A, a great example of that is in uh, Romans chapter one, it talks about God is pretty upset about the reality that people worship the creation and not the creator, that they, they can't even come to grips with the fact and, and, and God says it's very evident and obvious there's a creator and that they should thank God. That's one thing he really, I'll tell you right now, God, God's holy. And one of the main things, if you want to know as a Christian, your main response to God should be what? Thank you, Father. Thank you. It should be thanksgiving. That's what brings honor and glory to the Lord. He doesn't want your stuff. He wants you. He wants your heart to say thank you. But it says in first, first chapter of Romans, he said, and they would not give, they would not acknowledge God, that's the fear of the Lord, and they would not thank God for what they had. And so what's happening, that's what this global, they went from global warming, but all the science blew that away. They got caught cheating. So now they went to what? The global, whatever it is, you know, global uh, weather thing, or I can't even think of the name of it. Okay. The point is, in the Bible, it says God created it. He holds it together. He sustains, he sustains it. And there's one other minor detail because everything's about uh, see, uh, you know, the, the uh, gases that are given out by the cows and you know, all the business and everything. There's one volcano that's going on right now. And any volcano spouts out more of that than all mankind. If you killed all the cows and everybody committed suicide, it wouldn't have an effect at all. And yet you've got that lady saying, you know, down there in, in New York or whatever that, the world's going to end in 12 years. Well, the reality is that the world is going to end when Jesus comes back. The reality is he's going to snatch us up before that time. I believe that's what I believe. And when he snatches us up, did you see that plane leaving from Afghanistan and all those guys running around trying to get on the plane? Somebody had snuck up into one of the wheel things. And when the plane was up about what? A thousand feet, 800 feet in the air. What happened? The guy fell out, fell down and there's three guys fell off that plane. They were hanging on. Do you know how bad it's going to be when the rapture happens and everybody's gone and everybody's hanging around, looking around what's going on? Do you know how horrible it's going to be for the people that are left here that are not Christians? The no, they know because they said they were Christians. They know the gospel. They know who Jesus is. They know he said he was coming back to take his people and they're still here. 
Do you know the desperate feeling? You see those people on that runway, how desperate they are? They, they don't have any hope there, right? Their only hope is to have what? To get over here to the United States. But pretty soon, the United States, how many of those people are bad, act, bad characters, bad actors, okay? And what are we doing? By in, we're, we're in the point now where the hope for our children, the hope for everything. Now we have the corporations working together with the political people. So they take away, gets what happened. With a very short period of time, the middle class is going to be gone. And the little guy like me, when I came in 1974 and I can do anything and I can go forward and I don't have to be afraid and I don't even think about, you know, I never even thought about being afraid. It never occurred to me to be afraid. I never thought of that. I had hope. I had in my heart that knowing that my father had, had prayed, had put it in my heart. And once, and at that time, I had turned back to the Lord. And I remember my dad would pray. Every time I met my dad, he'd come. He'd just talk to us for about 20 minutes. And he'd pray, right? And he always prayed, you know, Lord, let your, let your hand be upon us and your hedge to be around us today. Your hand upon us, your hedge to be around us today. That we then give us your good and perfect will for our life today. That's it. And I knew, hey, God's hand was upon me, his head around me, and I'm charging. What, what, what would you do? Why, why would you not charge? We have hope. Look at this country. Look at all the things we have. And today, this message today, we're going to begin the message. And we're going to start talking about yoking with Christ. We're going to say the first message today is the yoke perspective. Okay? You guys look on the notes. The yoke perspective. I want to say it again, the yoke perspective. Those who yoke with Christ, how do you handle and deal with? What's your perspective in regard to what's going on? So let's read a, a couple of these passages and, and we'll move forward. It says in Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, it says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. John 16, says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Now listen carefully. This is the word of God. This is what Jesus said. He said, I have overcome the world, but you are going to have lots of trouble. Notice what he said. He didn't say, listen to the words he said. He said, you are going to have many trials and sorrows. Many trials and sorrows. Guys, that, that is a major statement. That means that we as Christians, the, the people, this, uh, these people that preach all this stuff, that you know, that you name it, you claim it, you know, prosperity gospel and all those things, that they have nothing to do with Jesus Christ when they do that. When you tell people that, that's just a lie. And then people who think they're Christians, they go to church and all of a sudden things start happening to them. What do they do? They lose their hope. They lose their faith. Why? Because somebody has been feeding them things just to get them to come and show up. And then the money goes in and they keep the organization going. That's not what it's about. You have a group like this. You want to make this group bigger? We can just make it bigger, easy. All we got to do is go to, you know, go, go to the next level and start promising stuff that the Bible doesn't tell us. What the Bible promises you is that you have hope in Christ Jesus because of his death and his resurrection, because he paid for your sin. And yet, oh, by the way, you are a sinner. We need to teach that. We are sinners. And he died and he rose from the dead. Therefore, you're leaving here. This is not your place. It talks about it all through the Bible. This is, this is, you are not a citizen here. You're out of here. You have another place to go. You're to live your life focused on the reality of where you're going to be in 10,000 years. And everything you do here, every thought you have, every decision you make is based on it. Because why? Now, listen carefully, because you are yoked with Jesus Christ. Now, you're either yoked with Christ or you're not yoked with Christ. That means it's either Christ in you, the hope of glory, or there's no Christ in you, the hope of glory. No hope. So what Jesus says, and I'm always, my big title for my book is, Without Hope, There Is No Hope. This is exactly what we're talking about. Now, if you, um, I don't want to read the, I, I did a little, um, little comment about woke and i've written it you guys are, are i'll just read the top it says woke the woke philosophy is the direct result of the thoughts and opinions of those 
who by a biblical definition are described as fools. For in the Bible, it tells us that a fool says in his heart, there is no God. That's in Psalms 14.1. It says, therefore, now this is therefore, logical, in quotes, and reasonable, in quotes. So logical and reasonable thoughts of a fool result in sinful and perverted woke truth. You understand that? Without God, without the word of God, we have nothing left but evil, sinful, stupid thoughts. Okay? So now let's read. What, what does God's word tell us? So let's go to the book of James, chapter 1. The book of James, chapter 1, tells us, as he writes this out, this is the first book written to the, to the uh, church, and the church is now in, in Jerusalem. They're getting spread out. They're being persecuted and all the things that are happening. And basically, uh, most of, almost all of the Christians were Jewish at that time. And, he, and he's talking to the brothers of Israel, and he's talking to those who have turned to Christ. And, uh, and here, he, this is what he says. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Now listen carefully. This is his major, major thought of how you and I look at things from God's point of view. The light, not the darkness. This is what he says. Consider it pure joy. I want to describe what joy is. Joy is not happiness. Jesus never said, I'll make you happy. He said, I will give you joy. Joy is something you own. It's not something that comes and goes. Your feelings, listen, your feelings come and go. Good things happen, you have good feelings. Bad things happen, you have bad feelings. Joy is based on truth. Joy is based on the foundation of the promises of God. I am joyful in my heart and in my mind because it's a decision I've made based on who God is and what he's promised, okay? That's joy. My joy God gives you is a joy, Jesus says, is not the joy or the peace of the world. You have peace and joy because of who God is, what he's promised, and who you are in Christ, okay? But if you're not in Christ, no, if you're not in Christ, you're not going to have that. You're going to be flying all over the place because all you care about is your feelings, good feelings and bad feelings. Now listen to what he says. Consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, notice it says the testing of your faith. That means that God never, that everything that happens to you goes through his what? His, his hands, because he's sovereign, right? Therefore, everything that happens to you, it talks about it in Hebrews chapter 12, everything that's difficult in your life, you can consider that God is using it in your life to make you more like Jesus and to give you the the, the gifts of the spirit, which you would never get unless you go through this training and the discipline that you go through, okay? This is like no pain, no gain. This is like going to the, I'm, I'm supposed to go to the gym and get a workout thing and start lifting and do all kinds of things. And I've been putting it off for two or three weeks. I got to do it, right? The reality is, to be very candid with you, it's, first of all, it's painful. I have to do it all the time. I never get to go away. It's always there. It'll be there till the day I can barely walk. So I'm putting it off. Why? And so the deal is that God knows I'd put off what? If God said, okay, Don, you really need to do this in order to become more of a man of God. And you need to do this because it'll teach you perseverance. And I'd say, yeah, but I don't want to do that. That doesn't look very much fun to me because I like what? I like feeling good. I like fun. I don't like not feeling good. I don't like bad things happening to me. I, I'm just like everybody else. My feelings are all over me all the time. It's called the flesh. It happens all the time. Now, listen, God says, I love you more than that. You're my child. Uh, you were showing me the boys' picture, right, JJ? Well, those boys didn't get the, to just grow up and do anything they damn well pleased. They, they, they had a father, right? They had a mother and a father, but they definitely had a father. And the biggest problem we have is most of the kids we have all these trouble with, you see them on TV, what? What's the big problem? Never had a father. Nobody ever disciplined them. Nobody smacked them upside the you know, well, smacked their bottoms or did whatever and said, hey, we're not going to be doing it. You live, you know, you're my son. I don't care what the guy did next door. You're not going to be doing that. In fact, you're not going to play with that guy anymore. We're going to find you a new friend. Oh, oh no, 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 no. hey, go ahead. Cry all you want. Get weird. We're not going there. This is not how we do it in our family. This is not how we talk to our mother. 
This is not what we do. Have you ever heard kids without fathers and how they talk to their mothers? Can you believe that? And the reality is that God says, I am a father and you're my child. You're not fatherless. You belong to me. And so I'm going to, in your life, we're going to work things out in order for you to become who I want you to be. And then, listen, and your reward, what's, his, what's your reward when it's all done? You die. <laughs> you die here. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I die, how could that be my reward? Boy, when you die, you go from life to life. And when you walk through that gate from life to life, you'll go, oh, my gosh, Lord, why did you wait so long? Why did you wait so long? I was struggling through all that pain and misery to live another stinking three weeks. Lord, oh, I'm so blessed. I have hope. Do you have hope? Because if you have hope, you have joy. But you won't have hope unless you know the truth unless you know Jesus Christ, unless you yoke with Christ. Because if you have to base your truth on what's happening and what you see on the news and all the darkness and all the bad news, that's not going to give you joy. That's not it. Now listen to what it says. I love this. He says, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. <laughs> have you ever not? I remember reading the... Uh, in Galatians 5, it talks about the fruits of the Spirit. And I like, they, they sounded okay to me. I mean, okay, I'd rather, I'd like to be like that, and I'd like to be that kind of person. I'd like to be that. And then it said to be perseverance. Is it, okay. I said, do you wonder? I said, I'm smart enough to know that if perseverance is in there, there means something has to be what? Persevered through. That means you have to go through some difficulties and some pain. And I was saying, Lord, you could have left that one out, you know? Because I thought that... Then, the new Christian thing, I see it on TV and I see these preachers, is if I pray enough and give enough money and I show up enough and I'm here and I do that and I do good things to people, I won't have those things happen to me. And I won't have those things happen in my family. That's not what God said. That's not what he said in the Bible. He says you're going to have all kinds of trials and sorrows. And it says families are going to be broken up. You know, children are not going to believe. Your wives and husbands are, are going to say, and mothers and fathers are going to have problems. All these things, because when it's Jesus Christ, it's 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 serious as a heart attack. There's no compromise. It's Jesus Christ. You understand? It's Jesus Christ. That's why if you use the name Jesus Christ in a lot of areas, everybody freaks out. They, what do you have to be? You know, we're not bringing religion into this. You know, this is a place we have fun here. You know, we're playing bridge. We don't have to talk about Jesus Christ all the time. You know, we we don't believe in him, and we don't. And we don't care whether you're a Christian or not. You keep your bubbly little thing out of this. And I don't care what you say about hope and joy and all this stuff. We don't like you. Be quiet. Otherwise, you have to leave. Just be quiet. Never bring up the name of Jesus Christ in front of us ever again. You think that never happens? You think that's not what people are thinking? You think that's not what happens? Wait just a very short few years. And you see what happens. The world is going in the wrong direction. Do you understand? And God said it would. And that means he's coming any minute. And I'd be ready. Because I want to be the guy. I don't want to be hanging on to the, you know, the, the edge of the plane as it takes off and fall. Three guys, you said, fell well, on that deal. The three guys, that's nothing compared to all the people are going to be wiped out. You go over there. Think I just got an email that we're supposed to pray for 229 Christian um, um, missionaries who are being beheaded and some terrible thing. And all the missionaries and 5,000 citizens are over there. What's going to happen to them? And we're going to send how many? Yeah, so we're going to send like 6,000 troops over there. What are they going to do? You know, they're going to wander around so that everybody can shoot them and and, you know, those guys are over there, they just, they say, great, send, send over 10,000 more guys. You know why? You see, because when we do stuff, we don't do it with hope, with a purpose, and to get it done. You understand? Because we're confused, because those guys are making decisions. Are they making decisions based on, do you think they're praying and asking God to bless them and those? I mean, seriously, you heard those guys, the guys that are the leaders of our country and all things. Where's Jesus Christ in this? Where are we trusting Christ? You know, when, when we went into World War II and, and how the prayers were, not everybody was a Christian, but boy, everybody, they knew who to pray and they knew who Jesus Christ was, didn't they? 
It was all about praying to God, the same God that they prayed to when they started our country, the God of the Bible. Now what are we doing? We're going to gather all the, now we have a God that's a, a generic God, just any old God, any old God you want. And that's the God it is. No, that's not the God that started this thing. And no, that's not the same God. That's what God hates the most is when people do not respect. That means the fear of the Lord and who God is. And they turn to their own way. And we only have a couple of minutes here today, but I want to, I want to bring this. Let me read this. He said, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Think about this, mature and complete, not lacking anything. What's he talking about? He's talking about as we go through this, we become more and more like Jesus Christ. Our attitude is different. It's no longer all about us. We begin to love other people. We be, be, we're, we're, it tenders our heart. We become, become compassionate. We, we're giving and we we, we, we help people. We take our resources, do whatever we can to be truly God's people. We take whatever gifts you have that God gave you, and we use those gifts to bring honor and glory to the Lord. Not pride, not arrogance, not, you know, accolades to ourselves, but to Jesus. So let me uh, read this here. It says, let perseverance, this is verse four, finish its work so that you may become mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, this is a big deal. If you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person, now listen carefully, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded. Anybody recognize that? Double-minded and unstable in all they do. I'm going to confess that that double-mindedness and unstableness has been a part of my life, and yet I knew the truth, and I asked for wisdom. So over the years, the Lord has taught me through many circumstances and situations some basic concepts of how you and I can step forward and allow God to work through us, okay? So here's what it is. I'm going to say it today. We're going to talk about it next week, okay? It has to do with whether or not you believe what the Bible says. It's that simple. You either Do you actually believe that this is the word of God and do you actually believe that what God said, he means? And if you believe that, you base, now listen carefully, you base your feelings, because this is where it all happens in your feelings. You base your feelings on truth. Do you understand? Your feelings go like this all over the place. But truth, is what you anchor to. Do you understand? Your feelings are like you see a, a sailboat and the and the, the sail is flipping back and forth in the wind, you know, fluttering back and forth in the wind. But you tie it to the mast, which is the truth. And that means that as the wind blows this way, it blows this way, then it could be, you know, you can deal with it. But the feelings are still there. I'm not saying you're feeling, I'm not saying you become a person with no feelings. I'm saying the feelings are there and there's a purpose for them and everything else. God made them. But here's the point. Your feelings are not the truth. They're your feelings. And your flesh, that means you in the flesh, that's what affects your feelings. They're all over the place. Are you hungry? Or, you know, you have sexual desires. You, you've got pride or you, you want to, you know, do, or you're angry. You've got all these things going on, right? And the feelings. But God says, look, I want you to take the word of God, which is truth. And I want you to take that vertical truth and I want you to put it in the ground it's stake in the ground, and I want you to build your tent. I want you to build your house on the rock, salvation, which is Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Now, that truth, now listen carefully, is the basis for your wisdom in order how to live your life. And you can ask God for it. He'll give it to you. Now, here's the big deal. Yeah, but how do I effectively, how do I use it? I, I can't do that. I, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't feel like doing it, and I'm not able to do it. Don, I've talked to guys in counseling. I don't want to do it. This is when I've talked to them. We find out the right thing. They said, yeah, that's what I should do. That's what God said on and on. Then they come back to me. Finally, I, because I'm a little irritating to guys, I get down to the nitty gritty. You know, the guys, he looks at me, whoever it is, and they're, they're, they all were having a wonderful talk. And all of a sudden they stand up to me because I push them just to the edge and they go, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do it. And I don't want to say that. And I don't feel like doing it. 
and I'm not going to do it. And on top of that, even if I wanted to do it, and let's just make believe that I want to do it, I'm not able to do it. I'm not capable. I have too many angry people. I have too many of this. I said, now, now we're talking. This is the old football coach of me. Now we're talking. We stand there. We're coming out of the tunnel or out of the whatever. And I look at the guys and I said to them, they're bigger, faster, stronger, and they've won 33 games in a row. This is a real, this happened once. We're playing a team that's won 33 games in a row. You can beat them. How are we going to do that, coach? I said, I'll tell you how you do it. You're going to beat them because you know you're going to beat them. And they don't think you can beat them. So now you just have to trust and go out and do your job. That almost worked, guys. We were right down to the last play. We had practiced all for like, this is the big game of the year. So we practiced for months on this. And we had a guy, I don't want to say his name because now he's about 65 years old, something. This guy, he was their safety. His, and it, I keep wanting to not say his name. And I told this kid, because I was the defensive coach at the I said, listen, they have a tight end. He's a big guy. He's not fast. He sort of lumbers along. You cover him easy. But they'll play all night long. They'll play every play. He'll block down. He'll run out. He'll run over here. He'll go back to get the linebacker. And he just dinks around. And they always used to run this little, you know, what do you call it? Um, trap, right, Mike, up the middle. And they'd run this trap, and they'd do it. And they'd trap. It was their best play, and they'd run it all the time. And we, we would take our linebackers, and we'd charge in. We were messing them up all day. It was so much fun. I just loved it. And so anyway, the net of it is they got frustrated. And here we are. And we're going to win the game. And they're about, they're on their like 40 yard line. So, I mean, we really got what we need and we're going to win the game. And I'm thinking that these kids have held in there. And there's one kid I told him, and he's so aggressive. He always wants to come in, fill in on the, you know, on the tackles, on the runs. Doggone it, if that tight end, they went this and they hit that. And they looked like they were doing this, uh, you know, the trap. And, it, and they took the guy and he ran that fake in there. The quarterback pulls back with the ball. And this tight end, he just made a little move like he was going to block. And then he just sort of lumbered down the field like he always did. He's out there 20 yards. And my guy is running in there to make a tackle. And there's no ball. And this is my safety. And I'm sitting there watching this. He throws a ball. And the guy makes a touchdown. We lose again. Now, here's the deal. The story, and we're going to end here. In my life, I've done that. A thousand times, right, or a hundred times. But I want you to know something: that that God has told you, in no uncertain terms, that if you will basically ask Him and then take the truth and act on it. You understand? Last week we talked about Joshua one nine. When you know, God's talking to Joshua, He says, "Be courageous." How does He want you to be courageous? Based on the truth based on what you know to be the truth. If that guy would have done what his coach told him to do and he knew it was the truth, they'd have won that game. But because he wasn't focused on the truth, you know what he was looking at, guys? Woke. Make-believe truth. That fake in the middle was make-believe. He didn't give the ball to the back. It's not what you see. It's spiritual darkness. It's hocus pocus. You make your decisions based on spiritual darkness, not on what you know. I know it's not. Paul said, we don't live by sight, but we live by faith. That means I know this is true, so I'm going to live by this, not what I see. And that's how we get away from living by our feelings and making stupid decisions so that we don't act like a fool because we know that God's given us wisdom. Do you believe he gave you wisdom? If you really believe that God gave you wisdom, you would not leave your house without studying the word of God. You would never do that without praying because you know that God knows everything and he's the answer to all your situations. There is no success without God in his benevolent hand. Really? I mean, I could, boy, I remember when I, when I was about 26 years old, I got that. And I, I mean, I, I ate it up. I drank the bottle. I did everything. I wrote it. I thought about it. I prayed about it. I was obnoxious and difficult like I am today in all the Bible studies because they'd be talking about something 
and it wasn't right. I said, no, no, that's not what it says in the Bible. Look, here's what it says over here. And at first it was okay, but pretty soon, you know, just let us wander through the Bible. We don't care what's true. We just, we're doing Bible study. He says, this is really God. He's really speaking. He'll really give you wisdom. He's really going to help you. Well, next week we'll continue. Thank you, Jesus. I love you. I love you so much, Father. Thank you for loving us more than our sin. Thank you that you've sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And that as we come to you and acknowledge our sin and humble ourselves before you, and we accept the fact that, yes, Jesus, you died on the cross for our sins, then you rose from the dead on the third day. Oh, Lord, defeating the power of sin and death in lives and making us born again, children of the living God. Our name is written in the book of life for eternity. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. Come. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, guys. God bless you. Thanks for coming, guys. It's great.